Welcome, my friends, to episode 129 of the Corbett Report podcast, Kalia and the Stellar Wind. Now, for those of you who are watching this video right now on YouTube, you might notice something very interesting, namely that this podcast episode is very special insofar as it is being simultaneously made available on youtube.com slash Corbett Report as a uh, video podcast, a vodcast. So for anyone who is listening to the audio of this podcast right now, by all means, please go to youtube.com slash Corbett Report and watch this report online. And for those who are watching this report on YouTube, uh, as always, as with the previous 128 episodes of this podcast, you can download the MP3 audio of what you're listening to right now from the homepage of the Corbett Report, corbettreport.com. Simply go to the homepage and click on the Episodes tab on the left side of the page, and you can find today's episode with a link to download the MP3 file. And of course, please check out the previous 128 episodes of this podcast if you have not yet done so, including a special edition of the podcast released yesterday, episode 128, the audio of Alex Jones's new documentary, Police State 4, The Rise of FEMA. Now, for those of you who are new to this podcast, I would suggest that you go to CorbettReport.com in order to at least to check out the documentation list for today's episode, which can also be found right next to the download mp3 link at CorbettReport.com. And I suggest you do so if you're interested in the documentation for what I'm about to speak about today, and you'll find a list of all of the documents, all of the videos, and all of the articles cited in today's episode of this podcast slash vodcast, sorted by time index. Now, today we're going to be talking about Kalia and the Stellar Wind, and that might be a rather enigmatic title. So to set the stage, I'd like the viewer or listener to cast your mind back to April of 2004, those heady days of yore before uh, the complete and utter charade of uh, the political system was exposed for all and sundry to see, and there was still an alarming amount of the public who actually believed what the paid politicians and liars and uh, people with their strings being pulled used to say regarding what they were doing in the hallowed halls of our government. And I say this because, of course, these days, trust in government has hit all-time lows, and we can confirm that by a study that just came out from Pew Research on, very recently, on April 18th, and incidentally and kind of humorously was reported extensively on April 19th of this year, 2010, very appropriately. And that poll shows that a stunning 22% of Americans actually trust what the government says. And that's uh, maybe 22% too high, but still it is moving and trending in the right direction. And another very interesting thing to note from that particular uh, poll is the graph that shows that, in fact, this distrust of government has reached an all-time low that really only seems to be mirrored in the 1990, in the mid-1990s, the figures that were being hit around the mid-1990s, right before a certain well-publicized false flag terror event sent those rates skyrocketing upwards as people rallied around the flag, as they always do in these types of false flag events. But uh, perhaps on a more humorous note, my personal favorite poll in that regard came out, in fact, uh, a little bit earlier than this one. In January of this year, 2010, Rasmussen reported that 45% of Americans say that they uh, would rather have random people from the phone book in government than the current Congress members. Again, a very interesting and telling sign. But in 2004, perhaps the distrust of government had not reached quite those heights. And so when the commander-in-chief, the, the decider, got on stage and told people in April of 2004 what the government was not doing in the war on terror, an alarming number of people were inclined to believe him. So the first thing I want you to think about is when you hear Patriot Act is that we changed the law and bureaucratic mindset to allow for the sharing of information. It's vital and others will describe what that means. Uh, secondly, uh, there are such things as roving wiretaps. Now, by the way, anytime you hear the United States government talking about wiretap, 
It requires, a wiretap requires a court order. Nothing has changed, by the way. When we're talking about chasing down terrorists, we're talking about getting a court order before we do so. It's important for our fellow citizens to understand, when you think Patriot Act, constitutional guarantees are in place when it comes to doing what is necessary to protect our homeland because we value the Constitution. Now, while many people did believe the decider-in-chief when he made that bold proclamation that wiretaps required court orders, it very quickly turned out that he was lying through his teeth. And the first evidence that the public was given about this came on December 16th of 2005 in a New York Times article entitled, Bush Let's U.S. Spy on Callers Without Courts. This report was filed by James Risen and Eric Lichtblau, and it reads in part, quote, Months after the September 11th attacks, President Bush secretly authorized the National Security Agency to eavesdrop on Americans and others inside the United States to search for evidence of terrorist activity without the court-approved warrants ordinarily required for domestic spying, according to government officials. Under a presidential order signed in 2002, the intelligence agency has monitored the international telephone calls and international email messages of hundreds, perhaps thousands, of people inside the United States without warrants over the past three years in an effort to track possible dirty numbers linked to al-Qaeda, the official said. The agency, they said, still seeks warrants to monitor entirely domestic communications. End quote. Now, that article was quite blockbuster at the time because it revealed what was quite evident to anyone who knew about the case and the relevant laws was in fact an illegal program. The 1978 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act made it illegal for the government to warrantlessly wire, wiretap anyone uh, with one side of the phone call or communication in the United States. And, of course, the FISA Act, as it's known, was written well before the advent of email, so it did not really envision those types of communications. So, it was quite evident to many people, including uh, lawyers and other outraged citizens, that, in fact, this was an illegal program, and it did not take long for it to start causing quite a stir, and many hats were tipped and uh, people congratulated the New York Times for having revealed this story and they were congratulated uh, among their media peers because they had been so brave to do so and had even printed the article on the website the evening before they released it in their paper because there was the fear that the Bush administration was going to use an injunction to stop them from going to press, uh, something along the lines of the Pentagon Papers, but as laudable as it was that they actually did eventually publish the story, it seems that, in fact, they had ha been sitting on this story ever since 2004, in fact, not so long after Bush made his infamous proclamation. In 2008, Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! talked to one of the authors of the article, Eric Lichtblau. 